we are lingering in the crucifixion this year. Most years, we only read this story, maybe a little bit on Palm Sunday, Good Friday if you show up. But this year, we're going through it a little more slowly, experiencing dwelling in John's version of this story. One of the resources that I use in my Bible study recently is a podcast called Bible Worm. And it's a conversation between a Jewish scholar and a Christian scholar about these texts. And it has really touched me these last few episodes to hear the Jewish scholar, her name's Amy Robertson, to hear her reaction to these stories that are so familiar to me as a Christian and to hear her talk about how terrible they are, how hard it is for her to read about this man being tortured and unjustly accused and today receiving a death sentence. We can start to take the story for granted and it's been good for me to step back and recognize how truly terrible the story of the crucifixion is and also how very human it is, how it's not this level of injustice and abuse is not unique to Jesus. It's a part of the human condition and it's really sad. And sometimes we jump to the spiritual aspects of it all and don't just spend time recognizing how very sad the human element is here. One other piece that has come up in the podcast repeatedly is their discussion of John's use of the term, the Jews. I switched, we normally read from the New Revised Standard Version of Scripture, I switched to the Contemporary English Bible for today's Gospel reading, specifically because of how that translation deals with John's use of the Jews, because throughout the Gospel, John uses this very generic and broad term. But in the Contemporary English Bible and a few other translations, they the translators try to make a distinction about when John is really talking about Jewish people in general and when he's talking about a specific group of Jewish people. And in the case of Jesus' trial here, it's very clear that John is talking about broader, a, a smaller group, the Jewish leaders. It's not the Jews who are trying to get Jesus killed. It's a very particular group of Jewish leaders. But this language used in John and elsewhere in the scriptures has, as we know, led to anti-Semitism throughout the centuries and some terrible, terrible acts of violence. In the Middle Ages, during Holy Week, Christians would throw stones at the homes of Jewish people and at Jewish people themselves sometimes. I have a a friend whose wife is Jewish and she said that Good Friday is still the most dangerous day of the year for Jewish people in terms of experiencing hate crimes. So we've got to be really careful and really responsible in how we read and understand and share these texts. We know, of course, that Jewish people aren't the only group that Christians have historically and continue to express hate toward. There's a lot of anti-Muslim hate as well. And so we can't let our story of tragedy 
cause new stories of tragedy. That's not what this text is for. Just like it was not, obviously not all of the Jews who wanted Jesus arrested and killed because Jesus himself was Jewish. Jesus' family was Jewish. Jesus' disciples were Jewish. It was a very small group of Jewish people who are part of this scene that we read about today. And as we know, it is not all, all Muslims who commit terrorist acts. When we hear about these acts, some people lump everyone together. But again, it's a very, it's a very small number of Muslims who become radicalized and who commit violence in the name of their faith. And we have to be very careful that we don't lump big groups together, just like we as Christians do not want to be lumped together with Christians who commit these hate crimes, with Christians who spout anti-gay and otherwise bigoted rhetoric on the radio waves. It's not all Jews or all Muslims or all Christians. And whether we're reading the biblical text from the first century or the newspaper from this morning, we have to keep that in mind. One of the, the lessons that um, the Christian scholar and Bible worm draws out from this text of Jesus' trial um, and death sentence here is that the forces of empire can't handle the threat of life, right? We've, we've got to back it up to John 11 when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. That's when the, these Jewish leaders decided Jesus had to die. Because if you think about it, the, the structures, the powers of the world, their ultimate threat is, is death. That's what they have to hold over people. And they hold it over people in a number of ways, not just by having a death sentence available to them. But if we, if we can claim our life from a different source, if we don't have to be afraid of the power of death that the empire wields, and the empire loses its power, and that's the threat that Jesus poses. If he can bring life, then people don't have to rely on the empire to bring life, and then the empire's power is, is, worth, is worthless. And that's a, that's a sobering thought. And it's a sad thought to think that Jesus was killed ultimately because he brings life, to think that all the forces in the world are just entrenched in death. And I, I know we're not quite to Easter yet. It may be premature to jump towards the hope, but I, but I am finding hope in thinking about our connections to our siblings of other faiths right now. Because just as we can misread this text in ways that cause us to distance ourselves and even do violence against people of other faiths. I also believe that if we understand what's at the heart of it, it can help us to find similarities and connect with and work with people of other faiths who also believe in a God of love and justice and life. Ramadan, the holy, um, the holy month for Muslims began on Friday. Um, I, I looked it up because Grace was asking if the Islamic Center here in town was hosting their meals again. They have before COVID hosted fast breaking meals at certain times during the month. And those have been something that our family has very much appreciated and enjoyed being part of. And the month of Ramadan is similar to the Christian season of Lent in terms of being a time that that Muslims seek God more intently and try to develop their faith. Jasmine and I took Camila, my granddaughter, to 
up and away. It's like it's an indoor play place here in town. And it was, this was a few weeks ago, it was nuts. I think they had two birthday parties going on. Um, there were just kids running around. There's a ball pit. And even though it's meant for you to just like play in the balls, you can imagine kids like to throw balls. They like to yell and run. And it was so cold outside. So this was like all the pent up energy. And I noticed that in the corner behind this this big indoor play structure there was a man bronze skin full beard and he was was on his knees bowing down he was he was praying it was it was time for prayer and god bless him if he didn't figure out which direction mecca was and pray in the midst of all the chaos that's what we need right we need that kind of commitment that so many of our Muslim siblings have to finding God in the chaos regardless of what else is going on and Passover Passover begins um, the evening Good Friday evening this year There is that that is a time when um, the, the Jewish people remember in particular God delivering them from slavery in Egypt. There is probably no more powerful anti empire liberation story than this story of God's deliverance of the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. These are our practices, stories that we can learn from and grow in in our efforts to be faithful as Christians. All of these, these three major religions, um, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, all acknowledge the grief in the world the pain, the fact that there are worldly powers that are not in line with the will of God. And all of these faiths offer loving and healthy paths towards living in God's life despite the death-dealing forces around us. I find a deep hope and some peace in the fact that we are all experiencing our most holy days together. Our world needs this holy and life-giving energy that we can all bring from our different traditions to bear in the midst of the chaos, the violence that is in our world today. We have a little bit longer to dwell in this story that, that is terrible, that is sad, that is sobering. We are in good company with each other and with our other siblings of faith. And we are in good company as we move toward the hope and as we find ways to work together for God's life in the world.